Artcentric Podcast with Rafi and Klee. Hola, you amazing artists. It's Rafi and Klee. And today we're going to talk about selling your stuff online and taxes, how to deal with taxes and VAT if you are selling overseas and you live in the U.S. Now, if you are from overseas and then you're used to dealing with VAT, this podcast uh, is geared towards people in the U.S. and selling stuff and and what that because that's what we know we're in the u.s so we're experts at that a lot of it works the same way across the board with minor differences though so we'll have some foundational stuff that everyone can utilize yeah so one of the first things that i want to talk about because i will shout them out anytime i talk about shipping is pirate ship pirate ship is a free service um where you could get commercial pricing on your shipping labels for usps and ups so we're not sponsored by them, but we are giving you just the deets on them. Anytime we talk about shipping, I, I want to give a shout out to Pirate Ship. And how this directly relates to overseas selling is that they help you find your correct tariff codes for your items, which could be a big pain in the butt otherwise. Not only that, but if you contact them and tell them, you know, you're selling overseas, you could get global export shipping rates, which is way less than what it costs to ship things overseas now that being said we have our amazing rogue artist family here these are rogues from all over the place so any of you rogues while we're talking about this stuff just give us your insight and your awesomeness Mm -hmm. uh on, on the subject but also if you're from overseas and you have um insight into VAT and things like that, go ahead and give it to us as well. I want to start this podcast by making the distinction that we're talking about sales tax on this podcast. We are not talking about federal tax. Well, let's, let's clear that up because I think that when people talk about tax, it's easy to think that we're dealing with you know, that there's just one type, especially if you've never run a business before. You hear somebody talking about taxes and and you always assume that it's like federal taxes and Mm -hmm. stuff. There are two different, like when you pay income tax, that is income, that is a tax that goes to the federal government. Um, The, what we're talking about, the tax that you charge or that you get charged when you're at the grocery store and stuff like that, that is state, that is retail tax right right? so that's what we're talking about income the federal income tax that none this you don't have to worry about that when you are uh shipping your art or selling your art that that comes once a year when you're claiming uh claiming your income right so so federal tax income tax is the money you owe from the revenue that you generate whether it's on a national level or a state level uh that's what bookkeepers do, yeah. right? That's what tax professionals can do for you. Sales tax, that tax is the percentage that is tacked on to goods when they are sold. So that is what we were talking about. That is a huge barrier to entry for a lot of creatives and people who want to do shows and stuff. Um, and it's, it can seem really confusing um, before you get into it. It can seem really confusing even when you're starting to learn about it, but it, it is actually pretty simple and straightforward and here's my legal disclaimer for this podcast we are not tax professionals we are business owners that have had to deal and learn about sales tax and stuff like that so then honestly it just about every single state and every country has their own thing so it's something that you would have to do research in depending on where you're at and we're gonna cover a little bit on all of that too so um we first learned about charging and remitting they call it remitting when you send that money to to the to the government basically you're you're it's flowing through you from the customer through you to the to the let's, revenue let's department. Let's be clear: the state level government, right? Yeah. We're talking about the state. Just the de- let's just call them the state. The so that state you don't level, get, yeah. Revenue department sounds so exciting. <laughs> okay. The st- <laughs> so the first thing to know is that that money never belongs to you. You are not allowed to use it for any reason. You're basically holding it until such time that you remit it to 
<laughs> the revenue department on the which, state level. Which is usually once a quarter or depending on what your income is. Like that's something you got to figure out with your county county tax office. In general, yes, it's quarterly. So we found out about all this when we were out at a show and they were coming around collecting uh, or looking for um, resale certificates from businesses. And if you didn't have one, then they were guiding you on how to go about this process. Jenny said, my friend who owns her business uses Clover. She loves it because she hates taxes and she only does taxes once a year. I will look into Clover. I'm not sure if Clover is dealing with sales tax or federal tax. Yeah. <clears throat> Shan said, I am just really lucky because my mother-in-law does taxes for a living and she does mine and it's able to, I'm able to take questions in on day to day. That sounds like it's federal tax also, yeah. if, if it's happening well, some, once a year. Some bookkeepers do take care of the business taxes as well. This so. is true. Yeah, you can actually hire someone to, to, do, to do your quarterly taxes. And you can hire someone to register you for uh, this as well. So let's first define something. When do you when do you have to collect tax, right? At what point do you have to register to do this in the first place? And the way it's defined on the interwebs and um, if you talk to like your local uh, Department of Revenue, you are required to do this when you have nexus in a place. Okay, describe what that means. Nexus means, basically, that you have a presence there and you are conducting business there. The easiest way to think about that is the state in which you are doing business, even if you don't have a brick and mortar location, is where you have your nexus. That's where you exist. Not to be confused with Alexis. Or the shampoo. Or the shampoo, yes. The <laughs> Nexus shampoo. I didn't even think about that. Um, so to to make that really, really simple um, in layman's terms, if you have a business in this state, then... Then you have Nexus in this state. And particularly in the county that you're in, in that state in most cases, right? So that's the sales tax that you charge... For the people, and really, you need to research this for your state. So, for example, we're in Pennsylvania. So, any sales that we make to Pennsylvania, that's our nexus. And so, we charge Pennsylvania state tax, mm -hmm. right, on the orders that we get. It's generally a percentage, like Shan Chan is saying, around 6 or 7%. Yeah, Shan Shan says that hers is 7% in my county, but I don't know if that's high or low. That's pretty average, pretty average. Ours is 7 as well, I yeah. believe. And it was 7.5 when we were in Florida, in Pensacola. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, in our that's, that's about average. Um, so, yeah, some, <clears throat> some counties will tack on like an extra 0.5%. Some counties won't. But you're going to be right around 6 or 7% which helps you <laughs> later on when you get into what you're charging and what you owe and actually how to automate that we'll get into as well. So how do you know if you have Nexus anywhere else? So basically what that means is we're in Pennsylvania. We operate a business in Pennsylvania. We have Nexus in Pennsylvania. We have to charge sales tax, whether it's in-person sales or online sales to anyone who resides in Pennsylvania or who is physically present here buying from us in right. Pennsylvania. So even if they live out of state and they... If they are here... Do delivery, like they they order for pickup, which we offer, then they do have to pay the state tax. Mm -hmm. We have it set up on our website to, if, if anyone in Pennsylvania is ordering, then it automatically adds the sales tax onto the sale at the, at the point of checkout. Those amounts are not rolled into our prices. That is a very confusing way to do things. When I first started, I did include the sales tax into my pricing. It made it harder for me to figure out what I owed. Um, and so I would always recommend just tacking it on 
after the fact. That's interesting. So for Clover, uh, said that it's 10% where she's at. It's higher, yeah. Valerie is 9.75. I know in Chicago, the tax, the retail tax is high. It's higher in California. Randy said, surprisingly, in Hawaii, it's only 4%. That's interesting. Nice. That's interesting. Now, here's where being a small business benefits you greatly, um, especially if you're in the U.S., you do not have nexus anywhere else but your state, uh, assuming you are doing under $100,000 in sales per year to any given state. So in order to have nexus anywhere but where you are, you would have to be selling $100,000 or more annually to that state. And right. that's for each state. For California, it's actually 500000 I think. Or over 200 transactions to that state. Ginny said annually. that Clover does state sales tax and not, not our awesome rogue fam Clover, but the, the, service, company, Clover. the service Clover. That's Thank awesome, you, Ginny. Ginny. Thank you. Um, so that's good news, right? So that means we don't have to collect and remit sales tax for any other state besides Pennsylvania until you cross a point where you. And it's for each state. Like I said, if you are doing $100,000 a year, but that's divided up between six different states that you're selling to, that doesn't count. So each of those states has its own threshold. Now, where that gets a little bit more tricky, and but it's covered if you have a print-on-demand service, wherever that company is, right? Wherever that warehouse or anything, because that's how Nexus works, right? So like, let's say that we have our business here in Pennsylvania, but we have a warehouse in Illinois, then we would have to pay Nexus for Illinois as well, because we own a brick, you know, a place, a brick and mortar location. Mm -hmm. So when you sell stuff on demand, wherever it's getting printed, wherever that's at, and it's shipping out from that area, then that's Nexus. However, most print on demand, like Printful and Printify, they already have the widget that adds that tax to their transaction, right? So if you do print on demand, uh, usually like, for example, we use WordPress, WordPress has a widget. So all the pricing and shipping comes from them, mm -hmm. from them. So, so I want to talk about something that Clover is bringing up here, which is where you are crossing county lines or you're crossing state lines and you're doing a show and the state still wants, let's say you're crossing the border from Pennsylvania into New York and New York wants you to collect and remit sales tax for them because you are temporarily doing, doing business in their state. Yeah, yeah, a lot of shows will, like Clover is saying, will provide you a temporary sales permit and an easy way to cover that. Yeah. Some, some places do a flat fee, like just pay us this much and we'll call it even Stevens. Or some places want you to do like, you know, uh, they'll give you a temporary permit to do business and you'll have to remit sales tax for that place yeah. for that one time. Um, so it does depend on where you are. It's the same sometimes when you cross county lines. When we were in Florida, we did a lot of business in Escambia County where we lived and we did a lot of business in Santa Rosa County, which was right next to where we lived. And Santa Rosa County had a different tax rate and a different tax office. So I needed to submit what they call discretionary sales tax, meaning that county is getting this chunk of the sales tax. Right, um, right. But you don't really need to worry about that. Um, it, you know, I, worry about it on a case-by-case -case basis if I'm, you're crossing state lines or county lines. Anhan is asking, which WordPress widget are you using for sales tax, I'm assuming? Um, do you like it? I just, it's just WooCommerce. It's on the back end of WooCommerce, and you just add your state sales tax. It's a built-in thing. Yeah, it's a built-in thing in WooCommerce. Um, so for online sales, obviously, you're not really worrying about um, crossing county lines or state lines or discretionary sales tax. But um, sh 
a lot of shows, like it really kind of is on the show organizers to inform you of any liabilities that you may have, but it doesn't hurt to ask. If you know you're crossing county or state lines, it doesn't hurt to ask what needs to be done. I feel like it also depends on the show. Like I know that we've gotten away with doing like some really small shows. Like when we did the Atmore show, like they didn't care. They weren't worried about it. Yeah, because it was the whole town. The whole town was like, we want artists here. And they were like, don't care. So who handles this for you? Uh, who who are you communicating with when you're doing this tax stuff? It is your local Department of Revenue. It will be at the county level. Yeah, so usually it's like the county tax office, um, mm-hmm. the Secretary of State in some situations. You'll find all that stuff in that. It's often not. It's sometimes uh, tied in with Secretary of State, but not. Not really. So like who you're communicating with and sending money to is on the county level. And then basically they're sending it to the state from there. Yeah. Now, when I did my so like when I was in in Illinois and I needed to get my um, business stuff, then I would go to the uh, county tax office. And then um, in Florida, it was the same thing, county tax office, but also like some places when they're smaller, everything is kind of tied in into the DMV. Into, yeah, it yeah. can be. Yeah. So, so it depends on your area, but basically like you're looking, if you're trying to just find out about this, you're looking for your county tax office and they're the people you're going to want to call or just go there and be like, how do I do this? Yeah. What do I need to do? Yeah. And, and don't be afraid. I think that that's the most important thing when it comes to this stuff. I know that a lot of what we're talking about right now might sound like gibberish, um, but a lot of these offices and stuff, like they understand that a lot of people are starting their business for the first time. Mm-hmm. So um, just, just go in and ask questions. I am going to briefly walk you through right now basically how this works. You know, we've done it in two different places now, and it was largely the same. So... Um, When you first sign up, right, you register, they're going to ask you for information. If you're a sole proprietor and you're doing business under your social, they're going to ask you for that. They're going to ask you for your business address. If you have a federal EIN number, you put that. Um, They're going to ask you some questions about the nature of your business. And then basically, they're going to issue you a resale certificate, which is really nifty because not only does this sign you up to collect sales tax, it allows you to buy supplies Free of tax. Free of tax, exactly. Wholesale. Anything that you you use to create something, you can do wholesale. You cannot just buy anything that your heart desires for any reason with those. (laughs) Um, It has to be business related. In some states, like for example in Florida, they will just issue you a certificate and then you just scan that certificate in or take a picture of it, have, have the certificate on hard copy and also digital and then you would just email a jpeg of that to a supplier that you want to buy tax free from in other states like pennsylvania um, they don't issue you a certificate that you send a jpeg of there's a form that you uh, have to fill out i think it's called 1220 rev that you fill out for each supplier in order to purchase from them tax-free. Right, which was absolutely confusing for me when we first, I was like, well, what am I supposed to do here? And really, it's just, it's really simple. You can print up the form, fill it out, and then you're good. Then what's going to happen is you are going to keep track of your gross sales and your sales tax that you collect, right? So that's that six. 6.5, 7%, 6.5, 7%, 10 if you're in California. Now, now here's the reason that rolling in the price, rolling in the tax into your price gets confusing because then that's the money that you're collecting and technically you should be um, charging tax on, on top of it. On top of it. So it's better to just figure out your calculation, have something that automatically adds the tax rate on your website. And then for us, we use Square for Mm -hmm. our transactions, and you're able to add the tax rate on your Square. You can tell Square, always charge 7% sales tax, right? And so it's going to automatically apply it uh, to any in-person transaction you do through the Square card reader. Or um, it's also going to do that online. 
Like if I send an invoice to somebody through Square, it's automatically going to add that sales tax. If it's an out-of-state person, then I have to go in there and disable it, but it's really easy to do. Jay Windsor has a good question here. Is it only free for like no state tax for materials and supplies you buy in the state you're registered in or just any purchase? No, I I do business with uh, Blick in different areas. Um, so I have a sales certificate, Uline in different areas. Mm -hmm. Got print is in California. It works um, across state lines. It works across state lines. It, so no, it's basically you are buying things tax free because you shouldn't be paying double sales tax on something that you're buying, particularly to create something that is going to be taxable. Mm -hmm. So exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, so Square also makes it easy to track your gross sales and what you owe because you can you can literally download and print up a report from Square. Um, I utilize Square, but I also keep track of it in a physical ledger that I keep for our bookkeeping. So it's up to you how you want to organize and, and keep track of that. Um, most of the time, you're going to owe that tax quarterly unless you're doing over a certain volume of sales and then they bump you to monthly. When we lived in Florida, we got bumped to monthly, which means I had to do that every month, every which month. Yeah. I hated, but also it made me keep on top of it. Here in PA, we're quarterly. So basically, uh, the Department of Revenue County, uh, county level, is going to have an online portal. You're going to log in. Uh, you're going to tell them what your gross sales were for the quarter without the tax, right? Meaning if you sold $100 worth of stuff pre-tax, that's your gross sales. So you're going to say $100, right? If your uh, tax rate is 7%, that means you owe $7 in tax for that $100. Right. You don't want to be taking that you, that's why you don't want to roll it in right because if you sold a hundred dollars and the tax was rolled in then you have to reverse engineer your subtotal. you got to figure out like what it's going to be and you might as well just make it as simple as possible and also you're, lo you're losing money that way and we've had a lot of artists be afraid that people are going to get mad at shows if they give them a price like this is 85 dollars, and then they pull up their square thing and then there's tax added but I will tell you, I've never had anyone get mad at me. Um, tax is tax. Everyone knows tax. Everyone understands tax. Everyone expects to pay tax. I would tell people at shows, it's you know, it's fifty dollars plus tax, right? Um, Kelly wants to know. So if you sell something online to another state uh, and sales tax isn't collected, do you still claim the sale as an income? Oh, when you're doing your quarterly report, so. In um, again, you guys, this is not for federal. This is for the state level taxes, obviously, retail taxes. Yeah, that's yeah. that's income that's due when federal tax time comes around. Yeah. Um, this is gonna sound like wishy washy, but I don't think they care either way. Um, so in Pensacola, in Florida, they wanted to know my gross sales where tax was due. And they wanted to know my exempt sales yeah. where tax was not due. So there were two lines for that. So the stuff that was not uh, included in tax owed went on the exempt sales line. And the stuff that was taxable went on the gross sales line. Pennsylvania doesn't quite word it that way. And so... It looks to me like they're really only concerned with the, the taxable sales where they're due their money. Um, and so if they're not asking you for it, then what you're filling out on that line for gross taxable sales is just gross, gross taxable, taxable sales. Because a lot of these forms will then have a calculator that takes that number and calculates the tax owed for you, yeah. which is really nice. But obviously, you wouldn't want to enter your non-taxable exempt sales into that line because then it would be calculating tax on those things. Exactly. So hopefully that answers your question. On the Florida form, gross sales did the calculation. Exempt sales did nothing. I think they just wanted to know. So you just <laughs> you just got to figure out, like, you know, like in your state what it's going to be. 
Kelly said, so I can buy art supplies tax. Yeah, but you have to register your sales uh, tax exempt sales mm -hmm. form with them. So and, in Pennsylvania, it's form. I think it's Rev twelve twenty. Rev twelve twenty, and so yeah, you're you you do have to register. So I do that with Blick and like Uline and all these, and once a year I have to send them a copy of my of the Rev twelve twenty form. Yeah. Um, some suppliers will not do it. Yeah, some um, suppliers won't. But so. most major suppliers that deal with wholesale accounts will do it. My jewelry suppliers do it. Blick does it. Yeah. Um major packaging suppliers smaller smaller chains like hobby lobby and michaels like they will only extend um i know for sure hobby lobby for example will only extend tax exempt status to charitable and nonprofit organizations right they won't extend that to businesses i think schools have special a uh, special thing to yeah. <clears throat> i mean if you're teaching classes then i would be like yeah so I'm ta tax exempt. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, it doesn't hurt to reach out to a company. I know Home Depot does too. So if you buy supplies from Home Depot, um, yeah, I would, I would go and get a business tax exempt thing set up with them. Basically anywhere where you're buying your supplies and your materials are going to go into other things. Clover said, I couldn't figure out how to get tax exempt. I've just been double taxed for a year. Yeah, I don't know how it would be in California. Just got to figure out, like, is it a form that you got to fill out or is it Do you have a certificate? A, yeah, if you have a, a physical, resale resale certificate is what it would be called. Then usually you just have to email a supplier and send them that if they do it and they'll grant you that um, tax exempt status. Shan Shan said, at least here the offices are nice about answering questions. I just feel embarrassed asking. Don't feel embarrassed asking you guys. That's, yeah. That's why this is such a barrier for a lot of creatives because it's like you feel like, oh, everybody must know this except me. And the truth is the minority of people know this. This is not common. It's like, not common knowledge. No. So the, these offices expect your call even though i had done it once in florida i had to call i here when we moved to pa because i was like not being i was not able to log into my little portal that i pay through and um they were super nice yeah super nice and i think they're especially happy to talk to you when you're calling with questions rather than like they're calling Upset. you because <laughs> you're not paying it yeah like those are, it's much more pleasant when you're calling them asking how to's. Um, Jay Windsor said, I have tax exempt from Michaels. You okay, select so Michaels, whether or not you want to purchase a uh, tax exempt at checkout. Yeah. So some, Michaels will do it. That's yeah. Right. Some of the places, uh, some of the places where I order stuff, that's how it is. You know, like if it's, they'll, they'll ask. Sometimes you have to like send them an email and be like, do you have tax yeah. exempt for small business and check on it like even me saying hobby lobby like this was me with hobby lobby like 20 years ago hobby lobby may have changed its yeah. policies yeah <laughs> um so yeah just check into it but there are a lot of suppliers that will grant you that exempt status to purchase materials and again you guys like all the stuff that we're talking about this is based on our experience with it the the best advice i could tell you is that when it comes to um, doing your business, like let's say that you're going to start a business officially, um, don't be afraid to ask questions. Go to the office, look up stuff online. There's going to be a lot of services, you know, that's like, I forget what they're called, but they're like super expensive. Um, one of them is really popular. It's like, you could start your business, your legal, like legal zoom, I think it is. And honestly, it doesn't cost that much to start a business, to get your business license, especially if you're doing sole proprietorship, which is if you're an artist, that's what I reckon. Start small. Mm -hmm. I have some friends that like and family members that they started their business legally and then like got like, um, I don't know, like a corporation thing and, you know, all this stuff. Just start as a sole proprietor. Keep That's, it as simple as possible. Keep it possible. as simple as possible. So the chain of registration goes like the Secretary of State is where you're going to register your business. 
uh, as a sole proprietor or as a LLC. Uh, those are the two main ones. I wouldn't go any higher up than that. I wouldn't file as incorporated status because that comes with annual reports and costs. Um, in fact, even being an LLC in certain states comes with an annual filing report cost. For us in Florida, it was like 135 Here in PA, there isn't one, but there will be one starting like five years from now that will be $25. Yeah. I think. So... If it's just you, sole proprietor. Keep it simple. Yeah. To register with the Secretary of State as a business entity, and then they assign you an entity number, is like $25 on average. Yeah. To register with the um, County Department of Revenue to get your tax certificate and be registered to collect sales tax is usually either free or it's like $5. Um, And then there's one more level, which is... Your city peddler's license. That's basically the license that gives you permission to sell stuff within your your city limits. City limits. So like Pensacola had one. It was $35 paid once annually at the same office. The like retail a, peddler's license. They called which it. Which is not, I'm like, okay, so I have permission to peddle. To peddle our wares. wares. Yeah. Um, and it's not the same as your sales tax stuff. It's just, yeah, giving you permission to conduct business in the city. So like for us, we, we were doing the farmer's market every weekend in the city. So we had the peddler's license that allowed us to do that. We always did that one in person because it was just easier to go to the county clerk's office and be like, here you go. Here's the thing. And they have different, they have the retail peddler's license. They have a busking license. They have... You know, so like that's on the city level. That's like the city giving you permission to do this thing within the city limits. Um, But honestly, all that stuff, go to the county uh, office, register your business, and then you just ask them, where do I, so what do I need to do next? That is how we got through this entire process. You go to the place and then what do I need to do next? Yeah, and I want to reiterate something. If you're a sole proprietor doing business under your legal name and your social security number, you don't even like you don't even have to do the secretary of state state level business entity part. Yeah. Unless you want to do business as a fictitious name, right? So then you're just dealing with local Department of Revenue county level and county clerk for your peddler's permit, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. then and then if you're up here in your LLC status, right, or your DBA is a fictitious name, doing business as, then you're registering with the Secretary of State. They're giving you an entity number. Then you're telling the local Department of Revenue for sales tax what that name and entity number is and all the other information. And then you're getting your peddler's license. But those are the things. Shan Shan asks, uh, that is for selling at shows and on the street, like physically, the peddler's license? Yes. Yes, yeah. that is exactly now, what Now, it may not be called a peddler's license where you're from. So it's something you have to look at. Yeah. You know? uh, yeah, they call it different things. They called it a peddler's license in Florida. And I was like, I don't know how I feel about that. They call it something else here. And they really don't care if you have it or not. <laughs> so. I mean, it's better to have it or not. It's better it, to have you know? it. So just you figure it. You figure it out. You figure it out as you go. But I would I would definitely go. The, the first place that I would go is where? The first place I would go is your county department of revenue. Boom. Go to the county department of revenue. Say that you want to be a sole proprietor. And then after you're done there, ask, what do I need to do next? And just keep it as simple as possible. There's a a lot now. Most states have um, like really comprehensive information online. Like PA has a really awesome website where it's like, here is everything you need to know and do uh, as a small business. I think most importantly, if you're looking for information online, make sure that the information that you're finding is like a state website, right? Cause there's going to be a lot of, 
There, there's a lot of stuff that whenever we look up tax stuff, there's like articles from like LegalZoom and like all these services that want to charge you a lot of money to do this. Mm -hmm. And let's be honest, you guys, you could do this on your own. Yeah. However, if there is, you know, services that somebody recommends, that's coming, that's advice coming from us. We do it ourselves. But like Jenny had said, her friend uses Clover. So maybe that's, you know, something that you'd want to look at. But always understand that like the price to start a business kind of see what what are they offering for the money that they're charging and the reason i say that is because like when i look at the prices that legal zoom six hundred dollars i think is the going rate ridiculous that's ridiculous mm -hmm. also this is just my opinion but i wanted to know exactly what was happening and how this works because the idea of paying someone else to handle it for me and then I have no idea what the process is or who I'm registered with or where the money is going to for sales tax. Like, I'm somebody who wants to know that stuff. Um, and there have been instances where, for one reason or another, I need our resale certificate number or I need to know X, Y, and Z about our registration status. And if I had paid LegalZoom to do it, like... I'm not sure I would know what information, yeah. I, you know. But that's you. And there are people out there that are like, I don't want to effing deal with it. Mm -hmm. And I don't care to learn about it. And that's okay, too. So <clears throat> now we're going to talk about overseas. Well, Shan Shan asks, I know most artists don't sell overseas because taxes and shipping make it, quote unquote, not worth it. Um, that's not true. But it is a pain in the ass, right? Uh, and I, the reason that I say that is because we have loyal collectors and friends and rogues that live overseas that it's not their fault that the shit is the way it is, is the way that it is with VAT and the, the whole tax thing there. Um, obviously through pirate ship, you can get really great discounted international shipping rates, especially with their simple export rate, which yeah. is basically freight, which in my experience has arrived quicker than standard in yeah. a lot of cases and is sometimes half the retail cost. So- And, and Shan Shan, this is one of the reasons that when it comes to shipping, add the shipping to your stuff because you don't know, especially when we're dealing with art, right? That I'm not gonna go into the rant of the free shipping bull crap, right? Because when you're dealing with art, you're dealing with different sizes. You don't know where it's gonna go. Um, it could be a lot of money, it could be a little bit of money, and there is no reason to roll in any kind of shipping where it's unpredictable. No. And that's why I will say, no matter what site, service, whatever it is that you're using, um, I will say, if you could calculate shipping, Get a shipping calculator for your website, for whatever it is. Pirate ship, if somebody's ordering something from you, calculate the shipping and add it to the order. Yeah, you can go on pirate ship and real quick get a quote. Really quick. You could put like their zip code or their country and get a really quick quote on how much it's going to cost mm -hmm. you. Chan Chan's like, I really got to look up pirate ship. You really do. Like, I wouldn't even bother conducting business online anymore without pirate ship. <laughs> yeah. Um, Chan Chan, you haven't looked up pirate ship? How many times have we mentioned pirate ship? Do, you, do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Don't be afraid of doing it. Just do it. It's free. So, overseas, tax laws have changed. Overseas, so I'm going to cover this really quickly and then we can get into depth about any questions Let, you have. Yeah, let's let's do it real quick. There's not really, I just want to give a disclaimer here. Whenever you're looking at videos online about vet taxes as a U.S. seller, um, what you're going to find a lot is stuff for Amazon sellers, stuff for Etsy sellers, big platforms that have figured some stuff out but there's hardly any information for small businesses, which is mm -hmm. what we are, artists that run their own website or any kind of small business. And to be honest with you, it's it's all a bit of bullshit. So- However- Okay, that, that was that's my disclaimer. There is a huge difference between EU and UK selling right yes. now. And 
So let's just get into it. VAT, value added tax. That's what you, that's the overseas equivalent of sales tax, right? And historically, uh, VAT was, the buyer has to pay VAT, right? Because just like when you buy something at a grocery store, you're paying the sales tax. Um, when you as the seller ship something overseas, historically, the buyer is, is having to pay the VAT when they collect the product. Uh, and the people that would collect that VAT were the customs agents. Yeah, like it gets into their country and then customs is like they look at the little sheet that you fill out and then they're like, OK, this person needs to pay this tax. Mm -hmm. And that's why item. when you're shipping overseas, it's always been very important that you um, send an invoice declaring the value of the goods so that they know how much VAT to add for the customer to pay. In some, in a lot of places, VAT is very high. Uh, VAT is like 20% in most places in the EU. Right. So uh, I understand the desire for companies to um, and buyers to avoid VAT. I have been asked to forge invoices in order for customers to avoid VAT. Never do this. It's a bad idea because you won't be able to insure your artwork if you do that. And also, tax fraud is really serious. <laughs> so <laughs> you don't want to be um, forging invoices so that your customer can avoid VAT. But um, when you're selling to the EU, you don't have to worry about VAT unless you're selling more than, I want to say it's 35,000 uh, euros. Each country has its yeah. own threshold. It's 35,000 in a lot of places. A couple places I think are 85,000. I don't know that any of us are doing high volume enough sales to be required to collect VAT on right. your website. So when we sell to the EU, we just keep doing it the way we've always been doing it, which is we send the invoice that declares the value of the goods. The customs agents collect the VAT from the buyer. The buyer lives there, so the buyer already knows about VAT and that they owe VAT. And if anyone ever comes at you uh, about they're angry because they owe VAT, just uh, politely remind them that it's their country yeah. <laughs> and it's their country's tax and you have nothing to do with it, essentially. Yeah. Um, so nothing has changed for the EU. I That's also, basically how we're doing it. We also have that disclaimer on every single one of our listings that for overseas, you we're know, not responsible. We're for not that. responsible. So that's something that if you guys want to look at our website and see how it is that we list, mm -hmm. mention all that legal stuff. I mean, it's not legal stuff. You don't have to put it on there, but I like having it on there as it's like, listen, it's in the description, like, you know, that this is how it's going to be. A while back, um, like if you were selling on a platform like Etsy or Amazon, uh, most of you probably got an email that said stuff about VAT and how Etsy and Amazon were being required to register for VAT and how you could use Etsy's VAT registration number on your packages, but how you had to have your invoice visible on the outside of the package to make it easier. Right. Um, all that I think remains true. If you're selling on a platform, you can use the platform's VAT registration number um, because the platforms are collecting VAT at yep. the point of sale. Yep. And the EU has actually made it easier. Like, let's say you just want to, right? You want to rip the Band-Aid off and you want to learn about collecting VAT. Um, they've actually made it pretty easy with the EU's IOSS one-stop shop, which is one VAT registration number and one place you go to collect and remit VAT for the entirety of the EU. You basically pick your country of nexus and that's your rate and that's how you do. And I think a lot of people are picking like Ireland or something because they have very good <laughs> rates. I don't know, and we didn't nice, do that. The nice thing about WordPress, we haven't done that, but the nice thing about WordPress is that now they added, there's a plugin for being able to add VAT ahead of time. Mm -hmm in WordPress. So basically, I think what I'm trying to illustrate here is um, when it comes to the EU or anywhere else, Australia, <laughs> um, Canada, it's no different than sales tax. 
Um, the way that it's handled is very similar to sales tax and your obligations as a small business are similar to sales tax in so much as if you're not doing thousand, uh, you know, uh, quintuple digits in sales annually, you don't even have to worry about it. Um, the one place where this is not the case is the UK. So we're going to talk about that. <laughs> This is where all the headaches come from. In 2020. Not, not from our UK peeps. We love our UK peeps. However, the being able to sell stuff to the UK has become an absolute and complete nightmare yeah. for small business. So we're going to cover this quickly. And if any of you um, here on the chat are in the UK or are currently selling to the UK successfully, um, p please feel free to chime in. Basically what happened is in 2020, uh, when Brexit happened, the UK changed their VAT laws. And I'm going to go over some terminology quickly with you. Um, the UK determined that distance sellers, and that means us here in the United States, it means sellers in Canada, it means sellers in Australia, and everywhere else abroad, uh, are now liable to collect VAT at their point of sale. And what that means is your website. It means you as the seller have to collect VAT on behalf of the UK to any UK buyer, even if you don't store goods in the UK, right? Your nexus is wherever you are and remit that quarterly to HMRC, which is His Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Now here's the kicker, and this is the thing that has me fired up and taking action. Unlike sales tax, which has an annual selling threshold that protects small businesses, Unlike EU VAT registration, which has an annual selling threshold that protects small businesses, the UK eliminated the annual selling threshold. You cannot sell $1 of goods to the UK without registering for HMRC VAT and remitting it to them. And there is no low value threshold either. It used to be that goods under $15 could be shipped to the UK, uh, and now that is one one penny. <laughs> so goods of any value are um, required. I will say uh, goods over 135 GBP are... What the hell does that mean? Uh, British pounds. Okay. Which is approximately 185 US dollars are a different set of rules, um, which makes it even more confusing. And it's kind of pointless to talk about that right now because honestly, it just muddies the waters. Um, so what most sellers have done is suspend sales to the UK. So either- Which really sucks, you guys. It really, really it sucks. sucks. Um, sellers that are selling on platforms like Amazon and Etsy, Amazon and Etsy are handling it for you, um, and that's nice, right? But sellers like us who are operating an independent website uh, are now required to register with HMRC, collect VAT from UK buyers as though we have Nexus in the UK, and remit that quarterly. So me being the person that I am, I did attempt to do this um, last year and I found it to be infuriating and very confusing and ultimately I didn't get the process completed. Um, I also did write a letter to HMRC just verifying that this is actually the case and that I'm actually liable to collect another country's sales tax for them uh, because they have laid off customs agents and customs agents there are no longer doing this from what I un allegedly allegedly <laughs> right? yeah um HMRC wrote me back a very scripted response that says yes if you intend to sell any goods of any value to the UK from here on out you are required to do this um I wrote a letter to the US Department of Trade asking if this is legitimate and whether this is legal. 
and what the U.S. Board of Trade is doing about it. Um, and I also got, unfortunately, a very scripted response that said, yep, that's what's happening. And you do, if you do intend to sell goods to buyers in the U.K., this is what you have to do. And, um, and here's what pisses me off. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't like not say okay, this. Okay, go ahead. This is the thing that pisses me off about this is that, so large companies, large companies like Amazon, like Etsy, right? They get to fit through a loophole there. But then small companies, the Board of Trade hasn't done shit for small businesses, right? As far as like keeping small businesses in mind when it comes to selling overseas. And that's because they don't think about small businesses because they think that small businesses aren't going to sell stuff overseas. It's just not part of the conversation there. And that's where when you look online, it is sparse of information for what small businesses should do in this sense. Mm -hmm. In my thing, I'm like, it doesn't matter. So if the UK wants to do this, that's fine. But it is the board of trade that needs to figure out what are we doing for small businesses and there is nothing for it. So yeah, it's easier to just not sell to the UK. Right now. Right now, but I refuse. I, I, would, I would rather circumvent the system and, you know, I'm... I get it. I'm gonna... I would like to clarify something, which is that Etsy and Amazon and large platforms are not getting through any loopholes. Uh, no, it's just the system works for them. It works for them because they have legal teams to handle it. Right. right? Um, they can afford the cost of automated software that handles it. Uh, they have people on staff that can do all the paperwork. I would also like, and this is a little bit of a rant, um, to point out that uh, Germany recently changed its packaging laws in order to promote greener efforts and um, basically reduce waste. And that meant that U.S. and everybody else sellers had to navigate a fairly complex website in which we um, proclaim our annual packaging waste being sent to Germany and partner with a third party recycler in Germany to reduce packaging waste. And I was able to navigate that German website, partner with a recycler and get us compliant for the reclay packaging laws in Germany. And I'm saying this to illustrate that if I could do that, then I should be able to navigate HMRC's VAT website and get us compliant, but I was not. And so here's what I'm doing, and I encourage you, if you want to sell to the UK, uh, to do your own research, but also to talk to your local government on a local level. So I am going to set up a meeting with someone on staff of one of our Congress people, because all that would need to happen to cover all of us small business owners is for the United States to negotiate an annual selling threshold of like $10,000. Even if that, <laughs> even if that. Same as everybody else gets. Um, the EU, what, they can sell to the UK. Anybody selling in the EU, and you guys that are in the EU should know this, you're protected under an annual selling threshold of, I think, 85,000 GBP. So you don't have to sign up for UK VAT if you are selling from the EU until you cross that annual threshold of 85,000. Right. Um, so the fact that no selling threshold was extended to Canada, Australia, United States or anywhere outside of the EU is basically spitting in our face. And so what I am going to try to do is to talk to government to see if we can get this, maybe get a petition started if um, the person that we sit with thinks that it might be beneficial to do so. All we need is an annual selling threshold and I then mean, it protects small business. And that's the thing, it would protect small business. And that way, if you have your website, you know, and you someone in in the uk is interested in buying your stuff it doesn't become this big vat nightmare right mm -hmm. because we're not going to be selling hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of art to the uk i mean who knows you might but at that point then you could afford to get a legal team to you know mm -hmm. deal with that 
but it, it's it's ridiculous to me that any form of government would not have something to protect small businesses when the majority of every country is built upon small businesses. And it's it's common practice. The selling thresholds are in place to protect small businesses. Shan Shan said, I would sign that. Yeah, so we, we are going to fight the fight. <laughs> we are. And so there will be more on this topic, like after I sit down with... Um, the person that whoever can see me that speaks for our our Congress person um, and find out what the next steps are. But and it'll be it'll be nice to put some videos out there that have nothing to do with selling on seller platforms. Yeah. That have to do with like just having a website. And what if you get an order from the UK, you know, and, and there's no reason to not have that option open the whole reason we have a website is to be able to sell art to the world i had a guy in india want to get a commission but i had no clue about taxes so um india uh most likely uh and and i would do your research but india most likely operates the same way that most everyone else operates where the buyer would have to pay the taxes due when the buyer receives the item, meaning their customs agents will collect that tax. You don't have to do anything. They will have that selling threshold in place to protect you. That's how it works in the United States. That's how it works in just it, just about every country on earth except for the UK right yeah. now. And that's that's where there's an issue. Um, I, I'm not afraid or ashamed to say that I have on occasion disguised an order as a gift and sent it over to the UK as a big middle finger. <laughs> this is where we're getting into tricky water. So um, this is not, it's not legal, legal advice. advice. Uh, but yeah, in in my in my defense, I will say, or not in my defense, I will say, I will circumvent a system that is unfair. Yeah. And at this point, that system is unfair. And whoever needs to really stand up for small businesses, which is us as artists, we are small businesses. And that's fine because you know what? When you get started, you're going to focus on your local stuff. You're going to focus on here. But as you start growing, you're going to want to expand out to where humans are, where there's a possibility that you're going to find your collectors. Mm -hmm. And so it might not seem like a big deal to a lot of people right now, but it will be when you're trying to sell overseas and you're running, you're okay to sell just about everywhere, but then boom, you get that one order and you're like, what the fuck? The software to automate this for us is more annually than what we sell to the UK. I think that there is um, an old video where we mentioned that we were going to look at Avalara. Mm -hmm. We looked at Avalara and I was like, screw you. You want to charge me that much money every year? Like it, that doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense to me. So one of two things happened. Um, and this is what I'm, I, I'm, I'm sorry, you guys, I'm so mad right now. Like just thinking about this stuff makes me mad. I have been researching and beating my head against the wall and being very angry about this since 2020. Um, and now I'm at a place where I guess the anger has sort of subsided in favor of now I'm ready to take steps to try and like That's to good. try and get some information. One of two things happened. Um, when this whole deal went through, right? Um, officials weren't aware. It slipped through the it slipped through the cracks. It slipped under the radar. Everybody thinks everything's hunky dory because the big selling platforms just complied. Um, or our government doesn't care about small business that much, and they were aware of it and didn't feel like it was necessary to negotiate a selling threshold for us. In which case, that either way, either way, it's <laughs> fucked. It up. needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um, there are people out there scouring <laughs> the forums because they're in the same position we are, and they're not finding answers. Um, all the blogs out there are from tax software people trying to sell you tax software for a lot of money. For a lot of money, because it's a big ball of. Bull crap right now. And so I, that's why I'm going to sit down with a local rep and see um, what the process is for taking it to Congress, 
for taking it to the Board of Trade to say, no, you need to negotiate with the UK to get an annual selling threshold in place to protect small business because that was my primary question to HMRC and to the Board of Trade was, where is the annual selling threshold that protects small business? And both of them just pretended like I didn't ask that question. Yeah. So that's what it is. That's all it would take, right? Anybody doing over $10,000 in annual sales to the UK can sign up for VAT registration. Yeah. Everywhere else gets $35,000 annual selling threshold. I'm like, we're not, we wouldn't even be asking for that. Same thing for you folks in Canada, right? Because you're also being lumped into this distance selling thing, even yep. though you're like part of the, you're like part of it, right? You're you're lumped in what with. What are you even saying? Like, are you fist bumping? Canada's like part of the under the thumb of. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know what you're even saying um, now. Anybody selling goods to the UK from anywhere but the UK or the EU, uh, this applies to you. Yeah. And so it matters. And so maybe I can take steps to get the US to do something about it, but if you're in Canada or Australia or you know anywhere else. Um, it'd be great. I, it'd, be, it'd be great. It'd be like a worldwide stink about this thing and hold somebody, some you know, hold them liable and hey, we, we want this to change because we are small businesses. And how you do that, I encourage you to um, talk about it. Talk to other business owners about it. Make videos about it. <laughs> Contact your local reps about it. Um, see if anybody has answers or information. Uh, <laughs> don't get... Killer read. Killer read. <laughs> oh. Um, so, let's talk about it because... The on hand said you've both made talking about taxes way more interesting than I've ever heard. Thank you. Thank you cuz I am like this must be people must be bored to tears. Well, I get fired up about it. Um get fired up about it but not like in a good way. Not like, "Hey guys, we're going to get fired up about taxes." More like, "Oh, we're going to talk about this." Crap. The biggest yeah. problem and the reason that nothing is happening with this UK VAT thing is because no one is talking about it. Yeah, that's that's the biggest issue. And, you know, I, I think there have been businesses like we've looked at like uh, forums and stuff like that where somebody asked a question and then three years later, you're looking at the same question and they're like, there's been no progress. We have gotten nowhere really fast and nobody's. And I'm like, okay, well then something needs to be done about this. And at this point I'm like, this is affecting our business. Sure. It's not affecting our business a lot. Like maybe, maybe a $200 painting will sell to the UK. Right. In which case the old rules apply for you. Right. Let's just cover that real quick. If you sell goods, that are more than 135 GBP, which is approximately 185 USD, or you can go online and do the conversions. The old rules apply to those goods, meaning um, they're going to collect the VAT at the customs office, uh, and you don't have to do it. But if so, you sell a $50... Right. So why wouldn't you just forge your invoice to say that it's worth more than 135 GBP? Well, because your buyer is going to owe tax on that. On that much. <laughs> That's why. Um, so some people have said on their websites, um, sorry, but we're only selling only orders over $200 can ship to the UK. Um, and some people have suspended sales altogether for about a year. We had a banner on our website that said, sorry, but we can't sell to the UK right now. If you want to buy a book from me, you're going to have to buy two sets of all my books in order for it. And at this point, I'm like, I don't even, I don't, I don't care. I don't care. I, we have people in the UK that have been loyal to us mm -hmm. for years and, um, Again, I'll circumvent whatever. So Ma, come, come at me, bro. Come I, at me. That's that's where I'm at. I am hoping to. Jenny wants to know. So this applies to non-UK English-speaking countries primarily. Interesting. 
don't know why it's interesting, but it is. Right? It is. <laughs> it is interesting. It, it applies to, well, let's clarify. This applies to non UK and EU because the EU this applies, negotiated a deal. This yes, this was part of Brexit. Yep. EU negotiated a deal. Yeah. This applies though to any country that is not part of the UK and EU. Any country that is not EU or UK is considered a distant seller and this BS applies. Yep. Now there are certain countries that have trade bans in place where it's like, well, they don't do business with us with or anyone. them yeah. or yeah. anyone, so we don't need to worry about it. But no, it's it's um it's everyone yeah. outside of the EU. <laughs> um so and that, that I think that brings us to an end. Yeah. Here. So this Let's, is what I could we could rant on about this. This is what I'm doing here. Um, I encourage you to talk about it and make people aware of it. Our our local rep on the state level, awesome person, was not aware this was happening, right? A lot of people are not aware that this is the case. A lot of people haven't reached that point in their business yet where they're even thinking about selling to the UK. They don't know this is the case. Some UK customers don't know this don't is the case. Don't know that this is the case. Yeah. Because their government has done a shit job <laughs> of explaining it. Uh, so I think the more we talk about it, the further along we might get this thing. But I encourage you to reach out to your representatives like I'm going to do and I'm going to be updating what's happening. But also, I would love to hear from you guys. If you successfully registered with HMRC, if you have struggled and given up, to register with HMRC, if you had suspended sales to the UK because of this, if you are seeking information like we are, if you're going to talk to your local representatives, um, I would love to hear feedback. And anybody from the UK watching this, if you have some insight, then share it here as well Please. so that we could we could Please. see. Because I mean, that's the thing. It's like we have... This is our side of the struggle in trying to do research into this thing and not really finding anything that is helpful um, to get us going because that's what we do. We we find things that help us figure things out and then we share it with you guys. And we have not been able to find anything. Three years, you guys. Three years we've been looking and there is nothing helpful on this subject whatsoever. Um. So... Yeah. Any information has HMRC simplified the process in any way uh, and that you know about and you have gotten through it and you're out the other end and you're successfully remitting VAT. Um, any of that. Uh, on hand said, if you have a petition to sign or script for our local reps, please share. OK, we'll yeah, do. We'll do. Uh, um, so as we do that, if if a, if I start a petition, which I most likely will um, and also I will copy and share uh, for anyone who wants it what exactly I said when I wrote a letter. <laughs> Some of those platforms um, have it that you could like click the thing and then it, they get a copy of the letter. Yeah. So uh, we will be getting that set up uh, within the next month is yeah. my hope. I will hopefully be getting a meeting with somebody in October um, and we will be updating from there. And I think if we all share information, maybe we can move this along in a direction. That's good. That's my hope. Yeah. And fist in the bump, meantime, fist bump to all the small businesses. Let's, yeah. let's do this. In the meantime, <laughs> let's, let's let's change it. Let's take let's take them out. Let's take them out. I don't know who we're taking out, but we, we're taking out somebody. Um. In the meantime, please enjoy the local sales tax information we shared with you and enjoy successfully conducting business on the state level. Yeah. Uh, Jenny said one more thing. This doesn't apply to the other direction. In other words, do the UK and EU make it easy to send to the... Oh, well, yeah, because, yes. <laughs> because it's us that they have to... If somebody's sending something to the US, they're dealing with the US customs, which make it hella easy for somebody to get their package yes, here. Yes, uh, sellers in the UK are not required to charge us sales tax because we have selling thresholds in place that protect them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the fact up. that that was not extended in the other direction is just 
Bullshit. is the main thing that has me upset. Yeah. Where's the selling threshold? So. All right. So that is, um, yeah. So that's what we've, we've, we've gone off on a complete rant. So that's what we have to say about taxes. Hopefully the retail taxes part was interesting. Hopefully the VAT taxes thing uh, here in the U.S. made you aware of what's going on and where we could get unified and do something about it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and hopefully you've just found it interesting. I, I know that this is, it's this, a lot of stuff that's just not exciting. But it is a barrier to entry for creatives. And the more that you feel comfortable in this arena, the more you can build your empire. Yeah, and be and be empowered in it and not afraid to walk in that direction. You know, the fact of the matter is that when it comes to registering taxes and stuff, if we're able to do it, then anybody could do it. For real. You know, like, like for real. Like, Clee cried. I cried on my, fir my first quarterly sales tax forms have tear stains on them <laughs> for all of time because I was very overwhelmed and confused. Yeah. So, but my second quarter tax forms were tear free. Yeah, exactly. And that's how it works. <laughs> So thank you guys so much. Thank you to the Rogues for being here. You guys are amazing. Um, thank you to everybody listening to this. Uh, I know that I know that it, this might have been one of the longer ones. Who knows? Maybe it was entertaining. Maybe it was super entertaining to like. Maybe that. Maybe we hit a part of the brain where it's like taxes have never been so entertaining yeah so but uh yeah thank you guys for watching and if you like this and you want to subscribe to more go ahead and click wherever it is that you're listening to this or watching this and yeah other than that let us be off we have a busy day of not thinking about taxes that would be great so indeed yeah. say goodbye clay good day adios